Hey, thanks for inviting me, but why are we doing this at 5.30 in the morning? Hey man, early worm gets the bird, all right? That's not a thing. Anyways, you ready to mouser size? What even is mouser size? See, Mouser Size was a show on Disney Channel in the 1980s that was teaching kids to exercise, but it's way more than that because the exercise craze of the 1980s changed how people perceived physical fitness. It became a major defining part of the decade, which of course glorified fit bodies and good looks, but more than that, it empowered people, particularly women. It was a decade that changed how we work out, when we work out, and who works out. Mousercise also couldn't have existed without several factors coming together. Cable television, home media, the trial and error attitude of Disney during that time period, we're gonna deep dive into that, but not only that, we're gonna sweat it out. Hey Josh, nice farmer stand by the way. Hey, thanks man. So my name's Josh Taylor, this is Modern Mouse, and today we're talking about mousercise and the exercise craze of the 1980s. today. Bye! Y'all ready to mouse your size? Hosted by Kelly and Plushart, a fitness and stunt performer in Hollywood, along with Mickey and his Disney friends, Mouser Size was a show built on the idea of making physical movement fun for kids. Of course, there was still gym class at school, but who wants to get pegged in the face with a dodgeball? I love you, Joni oh. oh. loves Chachi. It seems strange to think that an aerobics workout show for kids would actually pan out. In fact, there are a lot of things that are gonna be kind of weird in this video, so buckle up, I guess. But the show started in 1983 on the Disney Channel and ran with reruns for over a decade. To give you an idea of how impossible that would be in today's market, most shows on the Disney Channel run for one or two seasons with hardly any reruns at all. A show like Lizzie McGuire, one of their most popular shows of the 2000s, only ran for two seasons, with no reruns on the actual Disney Channel. Instead, it was licensed out to other channels after its first run release. Mouser Size ran longer than Lizzie McGuire, That's So Raven, Hannah Montana, Even Stevens, and most shows on Disney Channel. That isn't to say that it was a better show, however but its timing allowed it to keep running as Disney was trying to figure out what the Disney Channel was. See, Disney Channel launched in April of 1983, and Mouser Size was one of the few original programming offerings for the channel on day one. Most of the programming was older shows or movies from Disney's vault, but Mouser Size tapped into the zeitgeist of the early 1980s, which helped it find an early audience with young viewers and parents, looking to get their kids off the couch. In order to understand how Mouser Size became this weird show that lasted for so long, I think it's best that we look at some of the cultural events and business decisions that just kind of worked. Disneyland Records, Disney's own record label, produced some unique albums in the 1970s. The label that had been founded in the 1950s was more or less used as a catch-all for all of Disney's film soundtracks, songs from their in-house stars like Annette Finicello, or a variety of audiobooks for kids. By the 1970s, however, Disney's musical side wasn't really driving the record label. A lot of their films and TV shows at that time didn't really have a musical format, so the record label turned to pop culture. They released a disco record in 1979 titled Mickey Mouse Disco, which featured Disney songs turned into disco dance hits. Despite how weird that sounds, for some reason, that record exploded. On the back of the disco record's popularity, Disney decided to follow another cultural trend with the album Mouser Size, based on the exercise and aerobics craze that was just getting started at the end of the 1970s. More on that in a minute, but first, I think there needs to be a little bit more music talk with a segment that we like to call here, Adjocent. So here's the thing, I was gonna do a whole thing on Disney records. I was gonna get into the history and I was gonna talk about its influences on mainstream pop culture and the rise of kids pop. Honestly, there was enough content there to be a whole video into itself, but things got off the rails at the research stage because, well, this happened. I, I have no words. 
So for those of you who didn't grow up in the era, the early 90s had a bizarre relationship with hip hop culture. All the major news outlets and conservatives on TV treated rap like it was a blight on society. Because, you know, every generation has to have its cultural fear mongering. But it was undeniably popular. Rap was popping up everywhere. Awkwardly at times. Especially in kids media. One of the big standouts for me was, uh, you know, Fern Gully. Yo, the name is Patrick. The logic is erratic. But somehow I missed Disney Unwrapped altogether. Yeah, yeah, I listened to it so you don't have to. Because here's the thing, I swore an oath. I swore an oath as a writer and researcher for Modern Mouse that I was going to take no shortcuts in my pursuit of uncomfortable pop culture truths all for you. And so there's tracks like Ice Ice Mickey. Music coming straight so unbelievably bad that you would consider a self-inflicted head wound just just to forget the song. The whole album sounds like a parody of a parody. Special appearances by Tag Team, Color Me Bad, and Whoopi Goldberg. But if dogs are cool, dogs are good. Would you like to be a dog? I thought you would. The most confusing track has to be Ducks in the Hood. A clear play off of the very adult Boys in the Hood. You know, the one by Eazy -E from NWA, Godfather of Gangster Rap. Apparently, Huey, Dewey, and Louie are considered rhyming and dangerous and have just escaped from a maximum security kindergarten. What is going on here? It's crazy. Okay, Joe, but they use the real voice actors for all those Disney characters. And do you think they knew anything about rap or hip hop culture in the 90s? I don't know. Probably not. Yeah, I rest my case. Late! Anyhow, the major contributor to Mouser Size getting up off the ground was the movement in the late 70s and early 1980s to be more fit. A few things contributed to the exercise movement. One that many of us would recognize today is the rise of desk jobs with computers, white collar jobs that saw workers moving very little during their regular day. And to offset that, people were looking to sports or dance and other types of movement to counteract their work life of just sitting around. What plays an even more significant role is the women's rights movement. As more women were entering the workplace and looking to do more of the same things that men did, they needed a space for movement. Women's basketball and women's soccer on either a local or World Cup level just didn't exist. The sports women could play were limited, and even the sports like tennis, where women had been present for decades, had a lot of fights going on against inequality as male tennis players were being paid more than their female counterparts. But most women also weren't looking to tour the world as professional tennis players. They were just looking to get in a basic workout to either lose weight or keep tone. Prior to the exercise craze, gyms were mostly places where men went to lift weights. And to that extent, the gym was mostly a place for bodybuilders, not your average Joe off the street. I feel really judged right now. Hey man, uh, I'm not saying that you aren't going to the gym, are you going to the gym? No. See my Peloton over there? It, it's a laundry rack right now. No. No, I'm not going to the gym. Okay. Never mind then. I'm sorry I brought it up. But gym started to change by the end of the late 70s and into the 1980s. No longer was the local YMCA or Gold's Gym the place to just shoot hoops or to lift weights. Jazzercise classes became available and over time other cardio focused classes became accessible to both men and women. Although just like today, a lot of people chose not to go to the gym, whether it's fear of judgment or feeling like the only people that are there are big muscular guys lifting weights, whatever the reason was, that's still kind of what's going on. But that didn't stop the exercise craze from developing something new. And it really kicked off into full gear thanks to Jane Fonda and her workout VHS tape that debuted in 1982. 
Home workouts had been a thing prior to Jane Fonda, mostly through vinyl records from people like Richard Simmons or the aforementioned Mouser Size record, and these records were pretty popular. The Richard Simmons record had actually gone platinum selling over a million copies. Aerobicize had aired on cable television and even released a home VHS tape, but the emphasis was more on showing off beautiful women than it was about exercise instruction. Olivia Newton-John released the song Physical to become one of the biggest hits of the early 1980s, but it really wasn't until Jane Fonda and her first home workout video that things changed, and that change came pretty quickly. Are you ready to do the workout? This is the advanced workout. Stand with your feet a little more than hip distance apart, stomach flat, butt tight, pull up out of your torso. Jane Fonda's workout would sell in stores for $59.95, a pretty high price, and she would continue to have the highest selling VHS tape for six years straight. Because Fonda was well known to be an activist for women's rights as well as a star that most people knew, women looking to get into shape trusted her and her very expensive VHS tape. Jane Fonda's workout also set up some trends that we still see today. Originally set to be filmed in her own personal dance studio, the camera crew showing up recognized that the amount of mirrors in this dance studio just didn't work for filming. A small set was built so that Fonda and her backup instructors could be shot without the film crew being noticed. Using hand signals, they could also help those working out keep count of what they were doing and keep in sync with the music. This became pretty commonplace, with Fonda or whomever the instructor is giving positive feedback while counting along with the music in the background. Now any type of exercise video, you'll probably see some of these same things a small set, several backup performers, musical cues, and positive feedback to keep you going. And by the mid-1980s, anybody who had made a vinyl record like Richard Simmons had transitioned into the home video market. Even celebrities like Cher or Debbie Reynolds or Arnold Schwarzenegger were making exercise videos, but none could compete with how popular Jane Fonda had become. Her name and VHS tapes would continually be part of the scene all the way into the mid-90s. She continued to release a new workout video at least once a year, sometimes two or three a year. Her contemporaries like Kathy Smith, Richard Simmons, and Tony Little would all have great careers putting out VHS workout videos as well as selling other items like clothing or vitamins or workout equipment. With this craze kicking off in 1982 and Disney looking to create new programming for their HBO-like Disney Channel, they decided to tap in to this brand new movement and Mouser Size was born. to the TV show and on the back of the success of the vinyl record, they decided to do a touring version of Mouser Size, which in turn then once again promoted the record. Partnering with the University of California, Disney created a Mouser Size program that usually featured an instructor, Miss Mouser Size, that would travel from town to town, taking kids out of the classroom and into their school gym for a lesson or into a mall to do Mickey Mouse aerobics complete with a visit from the mouse himself, of course. Miss Mousercise was a role that anybody could fill, but it was always a young woman who was good with children. That became the crux of the Mousercise TV show that would debut on the Disney Channel with a 25-year-old Kellyanne Plachart who would play the host. Kellyanne's father, Alex Plachart, had been a stuntman and choreographer in Hollywood working with people like Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, Gene Kelly, and Debbie Reynolds and would get parts as a dancer in films like Hello, Dolly! and Mary Poppins. He'd even go on to do stunt work later in his life for films like Big Top Pee Wee and Batman Forever. And Plachart would open a stunt and dance studio in Hollywood where his daughter would teach jazzercise and other aerobic style classes. She was the perfect fit to be a youthful female instructor for the show 
where she could continually do different styles of dance and aerobics and do them for long periods of time since multiple episodes were all shot at once. Mousercise was a really unique workout. Again, coming from the University of California, the TV program was a mix of dance, jazzercise, aerobics, and a bit of silly fun. That fun was based on some of the instructions that came with the Mousercise record that showcased Donald shaking his tail or Tigger bouncing up and down. They may not be the most precise workout body movements, nor is the program the type that focuses on a singular muscle or group of muscles, but it was designed to simply get kids up and moving. I am unsure if there was a real legitimate worry about kids and physical fitness during that time as there is kind of today, but televisions were becoming more and more popular in every home, and there were large blocks of television that were just meant for kids, not to mention that there was already video game home consoles on the market like the Atari 2600, where you could play one of your favorite games all the time. Galaga. Seriously, that's one of my favorite games of all time. The fun is back! Oh yes, Siree! It's the 2600 from Atari! It's the video system with classics galore, from Space Invaders to cause that roar! Atari games are great. Man, Jazz was crazy though. You're riding around on a flying ostrich, even though those birds don't fly. There's pterodactyls and lava trolls. It's crazy. Weird game. Yeah, but you've put too much thought into this. Yeah. Old school games are weird. They were fun and simple, okay? You didn't need 400 hours of narrative to get into them. This might be a hot take, but I didn't really like Final Fantasy games because I don't want to watch seven hours of cutscenes just to press B to attack three times, then to go into more cutscenes, all right? The apex of video games is when you had one controller and three buttons, and you just continue okay, to play. Okay, okay. Holy nerd tangent, Batman. Aren't we talking about Mousercise or something? You're right. Okay, back on topic here. Mousercise took from the Jane Fonda workout look. Putting the cast of Plushart and some elementary school age kids together on a set specifically designed to look like a workout studio, but with small children the moves were never really in sync. And what they lacked in cohesiveness, they made up for with camera movements and Blushart being overly enthusiastic. Her introduction in the show began with a warning that if anybody was ever out of breath or maybe they were a first time mouse they could just take a break anytime they'd like. No stress. And if this is your first time with us, start slow and don't overdo it. Oh, we yawn. Now, if you have any physical handicaps, make sure to ask your doctor before joining us. Now, come on and have fun. That would be followed up with stretches and then a high energy workout that usually featured Mickey, Minnie, Goofy, or any number of costumed characters. One thing that differentiated Mouser Size from some of the other workout videos or TV shows was a focus and segment in health and safety. Obviously, most adults probably don't need that, and if they did, they would seek it out themselves. But Mousercise became a place to not just exercise, but also learn. Rather than having Kellyanne host these segments as well, an additional host was brought in with an additional set that looked more like a living room or a family home. The host, Steve Stark, had actually come from being a producer and wasn't an actor. He got his start putting together Star Search, basically a show like America's Got Talent where a variety of people would get on stage and compete in different categories to earn a chance at $100,000. He had no formal background in health or fitness, but stepped into the role of educator for the show, with the programming again coming from the University of California. And Steve would even join Kellyanne during the exercise routines by the end of the show. And interestingly, his stint on camera would pretty much end with Mousercise as he would go on to become an executive producer in Hollywood. I'm not so good. Well, what's the matter there, Steve? Uh, I'm just aching all over today, Kel. I'm, not, I'm just sore all over. Well, uh, you've been over-exercising again, haven't you? I think Told so. you you can't do that. You know, you know, I used to be able to lift my hands way over my head like this, Kellen, but I just can't do it anymore. Right, Steve. Well, have a happy workout, guys, and don't overdo it like I did. In recent years, he's actually had his own production company that has sold shows to various platforms. Shows like Wednesday on Netflix, or The Handmaid's Tale on Hulu, or Fargo for FX. 
Mouser's Eyes would run seven days a week on the Disney Channel, and despite the fact that no new episodes were really filmed after a few years, they still ran reruns all the way up until 1996. An additional VHS home workout was filmed as well, featuring teens this time with Plushart. Mickey would join them for the workout, but this felt a bit more put together. Since the kids were older, the movements were much more in sync, and the performance from Plushart was much more serious in her approach. Not unhappy or out of character, just a bit more focused on the routine rather than making sure all the kids were having a good time. Didn't they also tour around malls in between filming seasons of Master Size? They did. Actually, malls had a real wild schedule of events. Pop stars coming in to sing, Nintendo tournaments, Star Wars battles, real crazy stuff. Yeah, it wasn't just the 80s though. I remember there was like skateboard, X game style tournaments in the parking lot in the 90s. Mall culture was crazy. It was like everything about being a young person just crammed into one capitalistic space. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of places like that anymore, unless you think that's what Twitch is now. Oh, you mean Twitch is in the place where gamers watch 400 hours of cutscenes and just sit there and react to it and get paid in doubloons or lollipops or whatever? The blooms? Are you getting real old man yells at cloud territory right now? Well, unfortunately for Plushart, her time on Mouser Size didn't really flourish into a full-fledged career in Hollywood. But I think that her legacy with the show doesn't go without merit. Mouser Size might seem bizarre, but it provided an outlet for many children. It went forgotten for a lot of years, but more recently, Disney opted to bring back the Mouser Size name and release new records with a mix of new songs and classics from the first album. And during the pandemic in 2020, people found old episodes of the show on YouTube and started to use them as at-home workouts, or took the role of Clichard and instructed workouts along with the music from the record. I think this shows a need for a workout that's much more relaxed in its approach, or one that doesn't feel as intimidating as the moves, stories, sets, and hosts were all really friendly and approachable on Mouser Size. In a world of P90X and Peloton with hosts that have chiseled abs, it would be nice to go back to a time when someone like Kellyanne or Steve could just pop up and exercise along with you. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm some kind of health guru, because look at me. But I do want to say that now more than ever, I think that we need things like this. A lot of us are sitting in front of computer screens or televisions or even our phones. More now than ever, we're just sitting around. Children's after-school sports and activities are being cut because there's a lack of funding for them, and some schools don't even have gym class anymore, as they're favoring a more traditional in-school curriculum. And Mouser size might be gone, but there are some things that I feel are sort of similar that maybe evolved from those days of fun exercise. Nintendo and other gaming consoles have worked to create games that feature movement, like the Nintendo Fit Ring or various dance games. There could be more to do for kids or even adults who don't want to go to the gym, but also would like to be more active, and these games kind of provide that. And exercise equipment has gotten less expensive and easier to have in your home. Last year, I purchased a set of kettlebells and a small exercise bike, not fancy stuff, but enough to get by and it only cost me about $200. As far as the fitness craze itself, it died off by the mid-90s, mostly because of how much gym culture had changed by that point, and how many new types of exercise classes were accommodating women in particular. Soon, there was yoga, pilates, zumba, and more dance type of classes that catered specifically to a more feminine demographic. Even now, both men and women aren't just lifting barbells at the gym, they're doing cardio workouts with cycling instructors or finding classes that cater to them. There's still a place for the at-home workout, and workout videos in particular, as they've become a popular brand of YouTube video. And we've come a long way since the 1980s. Women's sports, although having a ways to go to be seen on an equal playing field, are growing in popularity. The WNBA and the American National Women's Soccer League, or NWSL, which is the hardest acronym I've ever had to say, continue to expand and grow and pay their players more. Even celebrities are getting in on the action now. 
In 2022, Natalie Portman, Eva Longoria, and Serena Williams, as well as a slew of other women, started the Angel City Football Club in Los Angeles. And a documentary was made about that team for HBO. I think that's a pretty big deal. And with each new season, players are earning more and more. And look, it's not the millions of dollars that we see in male-dominated sports, but those salaries are growing at a rapid pace, and hopefully they'll be on the same playing field as the men in the near future. Looking back on Mouser Size, what's great about it is just how easy it is to get into. It was a way for kids to have fun with physical fitness, and not in that mandatory gym class kind of way. And I think that we need more things like it. Exercise should be fun and silly, and a key factor more important than anything else, it should be approachable for everybody. Exercise doesn't have to be boring or frustrating, and Mouser Size proved that. Not everybody is looking to become Mr. Olympia or to get rock hard abs, but that's okay. And that's why Mouser Size existed. As somebody who has constantly struggled my entire life to find that sport or activity or movement that I just enjoy doing, Mouser Size proved to me and to a lot of people that it doesn't have to be a daunting task to get in activity. And sometimes you just have to dance and be a bit silly. <sighs> Thanks for that workout, Josh. That was crazy. Yeah, no problem, man. Good sweat. Hey, speaking of sports, don't the Anaheim Ducks play really close to here? Yeah, the arena's just right down the street, but it's weird. I never even thought about going to a game. And? What do you mean, and? Aren't you gonna turn this into some sort of continuation thing where you talk about the Mighty Ducks movies from the 90s and how a Disney franchise brought a hockey team to Anaheim? I mean, I could do that, but I think I have a better idea. <laughs> oh no, what are we gonna talk about now? Okay, hear me out. Instead of talking about the three Emilio Estevez movies and the Disney Plus show that they did, what if instead I talked about the cartoon show from the 90s that was all about alien ducks and dragons fighting in space. <laughs> what? Hey, it's Editor Josh here. I just want to let you know that this is the fourth episode in the season uh, where myself and Barry and Jack and Joe all get into some shenanigans. So uh, check that out down below, the playlist there. Also, there's going to be a bloopers reel from this video. So uh, it'll be up on Patreon. So if you're a subscriber there for a few bucks a month, you get a bunch of extra videos and podcasts from Modern Mouse. I think it's worth it. We have a lot of fun over there. Uh, and in the meantime, thanks for watching.